Ibrahim. Okay, um, I think the journey with my illness began at a very young age. Um, I just didn't realize it. I was, I think, born uh, being more anxious um, than you know the normal kid. Um, I think as early as seven years old, I remember you know feeling a lot of anxiety, um, being worried about even the little list of stuff. Uh, but you know, it's big to other people. But for me, it's more for other people. Sorry. Um, but I felt it was really big when I was going through it and um, I think when I was about nine was when you know the anxiety the um, Anxiousness that I felt became a lot of overthinking uh, It became obsessive really uh, But because I was a kid so a lot of it I could easily distract it with other things So for example with my friends uh, with my siblings etc uh, etc et but at the age of 12, um, it turned to a lot of excessive guilt. And I think a lot of times people don't really understand what excessive guilt means. You know, it could mean cutting class, but then you have this enormous guilt that you would obsess about, you know, days and days, and it will take you about two weeks for it to go away, for example. So as I was going through this journey, um, I didn't really know how to open up to my parents. Uh, because, you know, as kids, we always want our parents to feel that, you know, we have it all together, that we're independent. Um, not so much that I didn't want to burden them. I just didn't know how to open up with a lot of how I was feeling. But uh, what I realized is um, also at a very young age that I had a lot of, you know, emptiness in my heart. And I really didn't know what it was, you know, why I had that loneliness or emptiness, that kind of feeling. But you know, a lot of people think that um, have different perceptions about emptiness in the heart, you know, related to religion or faith um, almost always. Um, but really for me, um, it was this hole that I had and I could never quite fill it even with, you know, whatever things that I did, you know, either with my studies or friends or school. Um, and when I went to secondary school, um, obviously it became, you know, a little bit was um, until I went to college. When I started college um, in the US, um, that was when the panic attacks um, started to happen. So I had mild panic attacks really um, all through my 20s and my early 30s. And then, you know, I got married and then I had two, two kids. I was working really hard. I started my own business. Um, I was fully breastfeeding the kids. Um, I didn't have a maid to help out. So I was, I thought during the time, I was a super mom, a superhuman, right? And I never really asked for help until what happened was five years ago, I had a severe panic attack where I couldn't recover from. Every single day, I would live with that fear um, that today would be the day that I would die. So every single day uh, when I wake up, um, I would dread that you know the panic attack would happen. Um, I didn't know how to function anymore. I basically lost functionality in life. Um, I fell into this very deep and dark hole very fast. I think in about a month into the illness, um, I could already relate as to why people kill themselves. And I think um, that was something huge because you know I never would have imagined myself, you know, 30 years of living that I would ever be able to relate as why you know people end their lives. A year plus going into into the illness, um, everyone was tired. My mom was really tired. Um, my husband was really tired and very angry because everyone felt that I wasn't trying hard enough. Um, so when so one day my husband says, "You know what? I don't think you're trying," and that saved me. And the reason why I say this is because. See, when I was going through it, you know, I couldn't really self-reflect. So I thought I was doing the best I could. But really, I didn't have um, that push factor. I was just, not that I was lazy, see, because when you say that word, then you're going to contribute to statement. Not lazy, but I did not know how to get out from that endless loop that, that I was in. 
So when my husband says something like that, then I, I was just so stunned. Um, I was very upset. Um, I was very sad. And that was how I self-reflected. And what happened was that night, after so long, when I um, when I went to bed, I hugged my kids, and you know I my kids didn't even sleep with me during the time because I felt you know so just irritated with people talking or people being uh, surrounding me even though they're my own kids, and um, what happened was that night I hugged them, and instead of pushing them pushing my family you know further away from me, I you know pulled for once pulled everyone um, closer to me. And that was how um, I felt helped. And I started, you know, um, feeling very angry and not angry with anyone, um, angry with myself because um, the illness crippled me. And also I felt uh, really angry because I had disturbances as well. And I felt like, um, you know, shaitan or the jinn, we say, you know, every single day I would lose to it. I would lose the battle to it. And so with the anger that I had was how the willpower came in. Um, and a willpower is something very, very difficult to explain really um, until you go through some kind of you know, hardship or tribulation, then you would understand how willpower comes in. But that was really how willpower came in. So when I had the anger, when I found the strength through my kids, when the willpower came in was how I was able, alhamdulillah, to cross over to recovery. And let me tell you, other than the illness, Crossing over to recovery is the hardest thing that I have ever done in my life, hands down. If you look at you know the context of Malaysia, really, if you compare it to the other um, Asian countries, uh, if we if you if you look in Asia Pacific, right, we're actually Malaysia. Um, sadly, is actually one of the lagging countries in terms of uh, when you talk about mental illness recovery concepts. Um, patients uh, go having uh, whatever treatments, um, you know, being an inclusive society, etc., etc. We're very um, far behind. And really, my hope is with Miasa having this platform, having a voice, um, and hopefully the voice becomes louder, um, that we're able to make that change. Because even if you talk about the Mental Health Act, which was created in 2001, you know, the thing that is missing in that act itself are the voices of the patient, or the voices of the caregivers. So imagine doing something for the patients without the voices of the patients themselves. So how can it ever be conclusive? It can never be conclusive. Um, even if you look at the clinical uh, practice guidelines of any mental illness, um, there's no inputs from patients themselves. So again, how can it be conclusive when there's no inputs from people like us? And that is why I always say that the United Nations CRPD, the Conventions on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, tells you a beautiful story because it is a story where the whole CRPD happened with the voices of people with experience. That means it was led by DPOs, disabled people organizations, with of course the conversations um, helped by the civil society. But it triumphed over the people, the experts. So we say experience triumphed the voices of the experts. So this is a beautiful story that we can all learn um, from UN CRPD really. Um, so I think um, this is one of our hopes. I really hope that you know the government will um, have more um, discussions or open conversations about it with all stakeholders so that we know what are the gaps and we're able to address it. I think that again, um, the stigma has existed for the longest time. The discrimination has happened for the longest time. You know, patients with mental illness are at a high risk of exclusion because of this. The, the negative perception of mental, of mental illness from the society is actually due to, of course, lack of knowledge. But because we being the society, we perceive things as is without even, you know, um, trying to seek or trying to understand whether it is the truth or not and hence why there's so much so many myths out there and i think that the perception of the public of the society has never been challenged not aggressively challenged and 
this is also due to of course um, the patients not speaking out about it again because of the stigma so it's like a loop kind of thing and i see that with a platform like Nyasa that patients have become braver to share about their stories about their struggles and i do believe that 10 15 20 years down the road that the change will happen when more patients speak up and more um, care caregivers speak up so this is um this has forever been i believe the that missing link um, so this is the hope of, of Nia Sarancho.